Hey Cam followers. Very, very happy to have this gentleman come and join us. I've been having a bit of a giggle with him for the last 20 minutes. He's rather be known as Mike rather than Professor or Doctor, which is awesome. But he's going to be here tonight talking about something that I feel that you guys really, really need to know about. I think it will start to make things make sense. Let's have a little bit of a tendency to look like stick in the mud, party poopers, because that things don't have enough evidence or haven't got enough material to support people's claims. And then you've got other people online, social media, people's opinions, really enticing, really attractive to believe. I'm hoping that tonight's going to be able to explain where that difference of opinion comes from. So please let me introduce Mike, Professor Mike. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my background? Yeah. Uh, so I am a veterinarian. Um, I'm a boarded surgeon, have been for, geez, a quarter of a century now. And I did my PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, been a university professor at the University of Pennsylvania at Iowa State. And I've been at the University of Minnesota uh, for the last 14, 15 years. Um, I'm an endowed professor of surgery, um, which, uh, you know, don't know what that necessarily means. It just means that you, you got a chunk of money and you, you raise enough money to have that pay for your salary and some other research. Um, I guess I kind of, I consider myself a clinician, a clinician scientist. Um, okay. I'm on the hospital floor uh, roughly uh -huh. half the time. And I do research roughly half the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so really try to, I, I like that versus being in private practice because, you know, you can get really um, bored. I think if I were just doing knee surgery and hip surgery and fractures, those types of things, but I get to ask those questions that we can't answer and try to yes. solve those problems. And uh, that's what I find um, most intriguing and entertaining and enjoyable. Yeah, uh, and you actually ask questions, in this is my opinion, really relevant to the public. This is so relevant to the people that have the arthritic dog, that are trying to manage them, that are paying the bills, that they go online at night and they start trying to purchase anything that will possibly influence their dog's condition. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Yep. So let's go straight in there like swimwear. Let's talk about placebo. Can we start off with dealing with placebo? And then we're going to branch so people understand, because I think there's a lot of confusion there. Yeah, so a placebo effect, is it's, an, it's when the patient receives a, an intervention, a treatment, and actually benefits from, the, from receiving the treatment, even though the treatment itself may or may not be effective. So mm -hmm. the act of taking a pill mm -hmm. or the act of going to the doctor, getting acupuncture or massage or whatever, that activity um, that's the psychology of that activity actually makes the disease better. Mm. So not only it's not, you know, it may be just mental, but it's actually mm. physical too. And so that's yeah. uh, the important part of a placebo effect is that distinguishes it from other things we're going to talk about is the patient actually improves. Yeah. So that's, uh, so there's nothing necessarily bad with a placebo effect no i think the only time people get annoyed with the effect is if the intervention had no foundation of effect then should you be paying for it but that's a different kettle of fish so yeah, you would think that the placebo effect would be free um there <laughs> is actually a placebo pills so there was a mother many many years ago um uh, what was it called? It's it's placebo spelled back backwards. Okay. 
Oh. And so whenever her children would say they were sick and didn't want to go to school, she'd give them this placebo pill <laughs> to make them feel better. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was actually it was brilliant, you know. So. Uh, um, and then I think she actually started selling them or whatever. But it, it, it is, in fact, basically just, you know, a capsule of air. Yeah, yeah. And we will come back to this later. That whole concept of placebo being free could potentially mean it wouldn't work because we do know the more bought in somebody is to the intervention, potentially the more expensive it is, the more difficult it is the more likely it is to work because it has more influence on your psychological impression. But we'll come back to that. So what do we mean by the caregiver placebo, which is what we're talking about for our animals? Well, yes, you know, so for our animals, we first we have to kind of define what a caregiver is, and that's the, the pet owner, um, veterinarian, technician, you know, whoever provides care to that pet is the caregiver and the mm -hmm. caregiver placebo effect is where the caregiver believes the pet got better mm. because of the treatment mm. but the pet didn't get better at all so there's mm -hmm. no the the patient or pet you know there's no improvement there it's just that the caregiver believed that the intervention mattered mm. um so i think the distinguishing two distinguishing factors between the caregiver placebo effect and placebo effect. Placebo effect, the patient gets better. Caregiver placebo effect, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then the reporter. Placebo effect, the reporter is the patient. Caregiver placebo effect, the reporter is a caregiver, not the patient. No. And I think people need to know that we're not just talking about pills and, and lotions and um, liquids. Caregiver placebo can be therapist, it can be vet, it can be any form of person or intervention. And this this applies a little bit to me. I started doing a home service. I just started using manual techniques. I was thinking to myself, I'm kind of pretty chatty. You know, people quite like me coming around. Are they actually beginning to get to like me rather than they're actually seeing benefit in their dog? And you'd find that owners be like, oh, you're going to come back next week. You're like, no, no. You have to tell me objectively if this is making a difference because otherwise you're wasting your money. But people can become a bit attached to their therapist or their vet to do a therapy thinking it's having benefit. True? Yeah, well, the caregiver obviously has, uh, it's one of a long list of potential biases, potential reasons why there is a caregiver placebo effect or placebo effect is, uh, you know, how strongly do you advocate that this intervention is going to work for me as a surgeon? Like, oh, she's surgery's best thing since sliced bread, 100% <laughs> chance it's going to make your dog better. There's no way it doesn't work. You absolutely should pay me, you know, 5,000 pounds, dollars, euros, whatever you want to pay me for, for this treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's an element of charisma that can also influence caregiver procedures as well, nicely demonstrated by yourself. Well, I don't know if that was charismatic, but I gave it a whirl. Okay. Well, I've got my list here because I've, I've actually got about 17 questions to ask you, so I'm going to have to use okay. prompt. Okay. Um, so we, we've dealt with placebo being a good thing, and we think we've been dealing quite nicely with caregiver being actually not a good thing because the animal's not improving, whereas with placebo, there is improvement seen. Now, this is where we get a chance to jump into your pretty landmark study. This is how I got to know about you. And I think I saw you in London. Did you do EaseFords in 2016? I think you did. Um, yes. There you go. I saw you. <laughs> So I think it was there that you actually talked about the placebo arm of this trial. And I think it was carbapen or something like that. And you were looking at what happened. Can you explain so Owen can go? Yes, yeah, so it was it was actually Deramax, but in an said, so the response I would imagine having looked, having done a lot of work 
with the FDA, I would imagine the response would have been about the same with any of the NSAIDs. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was a large regulatory study. And that's important to know for the reader, uh, more the audience, because in the U.S. for a regulatory study, there's all sorts of outside quality assurance and quality control. So if I'm doing a regulatory study at any point, they can knock on the door and say, we want to see your data. And mm-hmm. right there, you have to give them the data. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, it, it, it's, it's very real. And um, about 240 dogs but uh, were enrolled. Half of them were placebo. But there was a chunk of them, I can't remember, 65 to 70, that had computational gait analysis that measures how much weight they put on the affected leg mm-hmm. and an, the owner survey. You know, and yeah. the owner reported whether the dog improved, got better, worse, or stayed the same. Yeah, and so, so you had uh, subjective and objective. And right. I think just spend a little bit of time here because a lot of people are going, whoa, I don't understand the difference. Yeah. Subjective is what people think might be happening, their, their opinion. And objective is well, we can't we can't doubt that data. That's black and white. We've seen it. Do have a flaw, but we'll come back to that later. But yeah, no. So you you, you did a better job of ex, uh, of uh, explaining the objective. So we measured we measured the patient, mm. and we measured the patient's owner. How yeah, good that? one. That's even better than mine. So, oh, good. Thank you. I'll make a note of that. Um, and then we compared those two things. And interestingly, as expected, I guess, um, the patient with arthritis, when you give them a placebo, on average, they were little tiny. I mean, on average, they don't change at all. Yeah. I mean. There are some little fluctuations, but for the most part, there's no change. Mm-hmm. But um, the owners reported on the patient said that they got better and better and better. Mm-hmm. As the study went on, they just kept saying their dog got better. So, uh, you know, we had a definitions of what was a caregiver placebo effect in there. And in that particular study, roughly 60% of pet owners reported that their dog had improved um, when, in fact, they hadn't. 60%. Let's just pause there. 60%. That's a huge number. That's a huge number. And arguably, that's an underestimate in this study Mm. because two things. One... The pet owner knew that in this study, the pet owner knew there was a 50-50 chance their dog would get placebo. (laughs) And two, instead of paying for the treatment, they actually were paid $500 to participate in the study. So I I think the 55 or 60 percent is, you know, for those two big reasons, uh, an underestimate. Yeah. What really blew me away with this is the next bit, the safety net, the backup plan, the vet knows best. It's okay. We're going to see him next Tuesday. He'll know. What happened there? Yeah, so the veterinarians did a bit better, but uh, it was about a 45% caregiver placebo effect. So, you know, the veterinarian, 45% of the time, they said they were better when when they weren't. And if I were to guess why I think that probably just you know and I was one of the one of the people doing the study yeah you know it's just but I I go when I evaluate that dog I in my brain more objectively can say oh I know this is there's a 50 50 chance this is this is a placebo yeah so I'm probably a little bit more conservative um but you know so you know, I I, I them to get better yeah, yeah you all, everybody wants them to get better. And yeah. like looking in a first opinion practice point of view, 
So I'm in my cubicle room with no windows and a slippery floor and a table in the middle. Totally useless to examine an animal in my mind, but hey-ho, that's what we have. And I've got my back facing the owner because all computer screens are against the wall, so you don't actually even often see them walking because it's ergonomically really uncomfortable to do that. You're trying to type up your notes from the previous owner. You're trying to read the history for the next client, and somebody's just shoved a note for you to report a blood result as soon as you've got a chance. So pretty distracting. So we're currently like this. I am going to be 100% reliant on that owner's opinion. So when that dog comes in on a slippery floor in a stressful environment, I'm going to be saying, how do you feel your dog has been for the last three, six weeks, whatever it might be? And I am going to have my weight of opinion from the owner's opinion. I am going to try and clinically examine but the laws of time are often set against us. Another thing that I think's really got to be taken into account, vets want to make owners happy. They want to make dogs better. They want to make dogs better, but they also want to keep owners happy. And I do feel that we, we kind of get influenced. and We try and be positive about things as well. Does that make any sense? You know, it, 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 it does make sense. Actually, what you said goes into a bunch of stuff that we might talk about later. But, uh, well, of course we want to make them happy because we prescribed the treatment that they paid for that's mm. allowing us to maintain a job. Mm. You know, so we our, our opinion is going to be is completely biased. Mm. And know. it's been tested. So the fact that you prescribed it three weeks ago and now that dog comes in and you're about to say, I don't think it's made any difference, is a, that's quite hard. But the, the other thing is you also don't want to disagree with the owner. So if the owners come in and they said, no, he's really a lot better and you yeah. put up palpating and go, you're 100 percent wrong. That then creates that, you know, my dog better than me. How dare you? I live with this dog. So it's a really, really difficult scenario. And there's no one specifically at fault. I think what me and Mike are trying to highlight is there's an element that we should all do better and there's a way around it. But we all have to jump on board that ship for it to work with clinical metrology instruments, et cetera. Um, yes, let me go back to my list. Have you got any more to add? <laughs> no, no, no. You, you mean, great point. I mean, you, you have to rely on the owner. The owner spends way more time the dog's behavior in the hospital might be different. And I may not remember what I thought a month ago, last time I saw that I patient. Person. Oh my God. So. I get jealous of people that go, Oh yeah, I can remember what it was like four weeks ago. I can't remember what it's like. Four weeks ago. Yeah, no. I, uh... <laughs> Good. Right. My next question, who will succumb to it and can different people suffer it to different degrees due to their own experiences, emotions, and dispositions? Yeah. So uh, both, caregiver placebo effect, placebo effect. I, I, I think the things that, the factors that influence those are probably similar. Um, one, it could be the nature of the disease. I mean, mm -hmm. it might be greater for arthritis than cancer. Yeah. So that's something that we, we should think yeah. about. <clears throat> but when it comes to the caregiver, um, you have to think about culture and you got to think about who that person is. I mean, gender could be a factor. Genetics could be a factor. Um, their personal experiences. Yes. Um, if it's something like acupuncture and they grew up in an Eastern versus a Western culture that could influence what they think. Mm -hmm. um, religion. Yeah. Um, are they religious or not religious? Also, the what Mabel at the, the poo bin? The you I'm remember sorry? me talking to you about Mabel at the poo bin, who says it worked for her dog. How that has a massive yeah. effect. <laughs> I always think of Mabel yeah. by the poo bin. She's got such influence, that lady. But um, if somebody else had positive effect in their dog for a different degree of arthritis in a different limb, in a different aged dog, in a different breed, in a different weight, that will influence an owner's expectations that that intervention is going to work. So there's so much that can influence it. But also I'm gonna be really, really naughty to talk about cost and sales and marketing 
can have a massive effect because this is something that really gets my goat. Um, we're not immune to marketing in chronic disease management. You know, you go online, you find something, it's heavily marketed, it comes with loads of promises and expectations. And that will have a, an influence on whether somebody thinks it works or not. Or do you want to disagree with me? Well, I mean, there's two components of that. Um, so, yeah, in general, absolutely, yes. Um, one, the, as I mentioned before, how it's how it's actually even marketed to some degree. And I, this is where I think the caregiver, like the veterinarian, should stay out of that business. Mm. I mean, what I tell an owner, I mean, that those are the facts. Mm. Now, and when I say the facts, this is what the science says. And oh, by the way, you're paying and want my opinion. This is my opinion or this is my empirical experience or whatever you want to do, but you have to qualify it as this is my experience. This is what the science is. Mm. This, you know, and, and you have to go from there. You know, mm. the marketing about it, that, that you have to stay out of there. But I think that that's dangerous. But when it comes to just marketing in general and cost, I mean, owners, yeah, absolutely. I mean, cost is kind of a different thing because um, there is, you know, cognitive dissonance, which we, I, you know, in that paper, in the paper on caregiver, belief, uh, caregiver placebo effect, we mentioned briefly, but it's really, it, you know, the, arguably, the more you pay for something, your expectations tend to mm -hmm. be greater. I mean, yeah. if I go to a hotel and pay 50 bucks, it's going to be different than if I pay 500 bucks. Yeah. Same. Yeah, and I've got a friend who um, always buys the, the most expensive because they just assume it's going to be better. Absolutely. That's the experience yep. that they want to have. Okay, so now we've got what this actually means for interpreting data. So question five, um, how does this caregiver placebo effect anecdotal advice N equals one studies? I, love that. I want a t-shirt that says N equals one just because... Small case studies, subjective assessments for proven. How does caregiver placebo affect us collecting data? Well, we, I mean, we, one, you have to measure it. I mean, it, 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 you know, data, we're actually, we're getting for some specific diseases, like arthritis, for example. Let's just say I, I, I did a, a big study. You know, I studied 100 dogs with arthritis, and I had no placebo group, placebo treatment group. And it was 70% effective. Well, I don't know anything, because that's close enough to a caregiver placebo effect that I don't know anything. Now, if it comes back and it was 95% effective, you know, we have enough historical data that I can say, oh, wow, I mean, I can make a strong argument that this is greater than all historical data but that mm. just doesn't really happen very often mm. so um really the only way to battle it is the the danger in not having a placebo treatment group is we use resources for pets with arthritis or whatever mm. other the disease might be and when i mean resources it's financial, it's emotional, and it's time, mm. you know? Yeah. And if, you know, you have something like arthritis, that's a lifelong disease. And so you have to use those owner's resources prudently. Mm. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah, and, and, and if, you, if you invest them in something that, you know, doesn't have the science, then... Yeah ultimately the patient suffers yeah and i think that's a really fair point like so people always think side effects are going to be adverse reactions with the dog so that's your first thought is vomiting diarrhea hives um you know hepatotoxicity but a side effect in my opinion in my opinion is wasted time wasted resources wasted finances and leaving that dog in a state that needs attention for longer and what knock-on effect that can have. So that is a side effect, in 
my opinion, towards that treatment plan. But um, and I, th I think what you what you were saying is that trials really need to have a placebo arm because otherwise they're going to be overtly interpreted as positive, more positive than they probably are. And when you were just talking about you, if you had a study and it came back 95 percent positive, I was reading a paper today that actually said this is too good to be true. This this this. You know, we know, we know that this isn't possible. So this trial, there's a flaw in the methodology of this trial somewhere. So I think that's something really important to kind of talk about now, which is how powerful is is placebo in animals? So I can remember, it might have been you talking again, but when somebody said that you can expect a 30% improvement with nothing, and a non-steroidal or an intervention has to be beyond that by far for it to be clinically effective. I was like, holy, that's nuts. So can you just explain that for owners so they understand what I'm trying to say? Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, well, let me just talk about placebo effect by proxy. Yeah. And maybe that's kind of where you're going. I'm not sure. But um, so let's just say I, if I enroll 100 dogs with arthritis um, and, you know, I give them all 100 a placebo, you know, so there are a certain number of dogs that will actually improve because they are enrolled in the study. Mm -hmm. So dogs can get better because and the reason they get better, and I'm not talking about natural variation of the disease. I'm saying they actually get better because the owner's behavior changed. Mm. Maybe they're like, oh, yeah, I got to, oh, he's on this arthritis study. They pay more attention to it. They watch the dog's diet. Maybe the dog loses some weight. Maybe the walks become more regular. Mm. Um, and so, you know, they, uh, um, so the owner's behaviors changed and that actually influenced the pet's um, disease. Mm. So a certain number of them actually will get better. That exact number, um, I don't know, but you said 30%. I, I, actually, think, I'm a... I, I think that that's, uh, um, sounds like a really sound guess. Sound guess. I think... I, well, I definitely know I've read it somewhere, like 27 to 30 sort of thing, that though that percentage of dogs will improve. And as you say, yeah. so many reasons. And I think it's very natural. Let's just spend a little bit of time. If I've taken my dog to the vet and my vet's told me that there's something wrong, it doesn't matter what pill I'm giving. My attitude to that dog will change. And as you say, it might be I'm a little bit more careful. I don't let them jump out of the car as often because I'm now a bit worried might buy them a new bed, you know, because I want them to be more comfortable. Um, I put a rug down. He mentioned something about that. And all these little things can add, add up to a positive outcome. So you'd want any paid for intervention that she could have side effects, which we'll come back to, um, to be beyond that for it to really yeah. be effective. And, well, and, and that's the ideal reason to... I mean, the ideal study has a, a treatment, an intervention arm, and a, and a placebo arm, mm. uh, or a standard of care arm is another way to do it. Yeah. Where you and then, like, Sue, so, because you said you do a lot of work with, with the drug trials and stuff, what would you be looking for for a, a non steroidal or any intervention, therapeutic intervention, to be classified? As effective beyond that thirty, what what region would you be going? Yeah, we can we can safely say that this has a positive influence. Minimum seventy percent. Minimum seven out of ten dogs should improve. Like if you're thinking about a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so that would be standard of care, right? Yeah. And I would say the, you know, um. COX-2 selective anti-inflammatories um, will have 70 to 80% efficacy with, uh, you know, a less than, uh, you know, 5% adverse events. 
Yeah. And okay. so I, 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 it needs to be at least that because otherwise I have a decent treatment. If it's not, if it's not as effective with, you know, maybe it has the same efficacy with no side effects, mm. you know, then, well, then maybe there's a little wiggle room, but that mean, but for the most part, 70 to 80 percent 70 80 percent so guys remember these figures because i find them quite powerful when i do lectures and owner workshops being able to say you know three out of ten of you in the room will probably see benefit without having done any therapeutic intervention just with change of lifestyle just doing things slightly slightly differently but for this intervention to be effective we've got to be looking at seven out of ten of you are seeing seeing gains so that's that's quite important that you know that Oh one God. other quick thing Levine's is, watching david levine's watching scary man <laughs> one, one other quick McLevin. thing is it's not just improvement but it's the amount of improvement you have to look at mm. because you know um you know for example in our study when we just looked at dogs over 42 days 49 days um it wasn't uncommon for there to be um a little waxing and waning Mm. Plus or minus 5%. It was actually right. unusual for there to be a 10% difference. A 10% right. only, you know, only one dog had improved improved more than 10%. Yeah. I mean, I look at that and that's just chance, you know, yeah. whatever. So uh, I think when you're talking about improvement, I think there's a qualifier that needs to be added to that. And that is how big of an improvement yeah which gives me a perfect to just stop talking about river and just spend a little bit of time telling owners what you were talking about the natural waxing and waning because i really don't think many people understand that so when they go and try a new intervention you've got to admit that you're going to do it when your dog's at its worst so the ipad comes out 11 o'clock at night and you start going through and trying to find an intervention because you've just seen your dog look really quite sore it's made you feel really ill inside you need to do something because you can't stand seeing them like that you go on your ipad you start buying stuff and then lo and behold as soon as you introduce this new product or therapy the dog starts getting better you're like oh i must have been the therapy glad i went on amazon at what's happening there just so people know that i'm not being completely facetious Um, so are, are you leaning towards regression to the mean? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, really, uh, well, I mean, the reality of it is, is so you can have an extreme response to anything. It can be extremely good or extremely bad, but the reality of it is, you, is the average response is what you should expect. And mm -hmm. so if things get extremely good or if, extremely bad I'm like oh this is much better than i thought mm. um you know just be skeptical so for mm. example this is uh there's a lot of kind of different ways to kind of think about what this means and let's say i gave you 10 coins and and you were going to flip them heads or tails mm. well if you had to flip them those 10 coins 10 times each of them you would expect it roughly to be it would be heads half the time and tails half the time for all of them. But what yeah. if you had one coin, it landed on heads every time. You're like, this is my freaking lucky coin. <laughs> so what you should do there is you should be skeptical and say, well, maybe that was just chance. And that's really what regression to the mean is, is it's about, was this a chance response or a yeah. lucky response? So if I took mm. that lucky coin and retested it, would it be heads 10 times in a mm. row? Probably not. Regression to the mean is if you retest that, it'll probably be pretty close to 50-50 a second time. Yeah. Okay. And then so for somebody that's going, oh, I'm, I'm dabbling, I'm, I'm almost there, I feel that I'm a bit lost, in context, we're kind of saying that arthritis, that you have good days and then you kind of have bad days and your good days and you have this kind of like baseline going through the middle. If you were to do a graph, you would find that there's just a natural 
slow deterioration over years, but there'd be over a Over years, yeah. But it's, and, it's, there's going to be some good days and bad days and good weeks and bad weeks, but I, I think you have to, the way I kind of have this conversation with owners is this is a lifelong problem. Mm. And there are going to be good days and bad days and good weeks and bad weeks. But we have to think about where are we three months or six months or three years or six years from now. Mm. And that's, yeah. that's, you know, so how can we treat this for the long run? And yeah. are there some, are there some pain medications, some things we can do when there are, is a bad day? What do we do when mm. there's a really bad day? Mm. We have to have the plan for that. But we also yeah. we have to have a plan for the long term plan. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think, um, okay, confessional here. A few years ago, when I started getting obsessed about it, I realized by opening owners' eyes to the natural variation, the good days, the bad days, and asking them to be more objective and observe, I actually made their life harder. I made their life harder. I made them more emotionally entrenched into the good days and the bad days. They went on an emotional roller coaster instead of being blissfully a little bit ignorant, shall we say. And I won't lie, I did spend a lot of time going, is that right for the owners? Because I'm going to make life difficult. Now, that's a terrible thing to say because obviously we never want any dogs to suffer. What I'm trying to illustrate with this point is that a hell of a lot more attention needs to be given to owners because this is an emotional roller coaster. And most people who are following Cam are very, very attached to their dog and watching the bad days is heartbreaking. So we need to be sending these owners, as you say, with the emergency kits, you know, so we've got a, a long-term plan and this is your this is your little backup plan. So when you have a bad day, this is what you're gonna do and then you're gonna come out of it the other side in about three, seven days. And um, I think that's something that would be for owners to know is that you the vet has got a backup plan for short term and they've got a long term plan as well um so yes right it's a little bit of a side there back to our list so what are we going to do about it how can we because at the moment everybody's going well we're doomed we're doomed nothing is what it says it is you know how can we actually try and be more accurate make sure that what we see is actually real improvement um, well, the big thing is awareness. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously number one is, you know, if you're unaware of a caregiver placebo effect, it doesn't even cross your mind that you could be affected by it mm -hmm. or that your veterinarian could be affected by it. Um, I think you have to be, and then the fact that maybe that's influenced by marketing, it's influenced mm -hmm. by how much you paid for an intervention. Um, and then I think, it, you know, and this is somewhat cynical of me, but I think it's also influenced by the veterinarian, the veterinarian mm. and the uh, model, financial model of most veterinary markets. And that is fee for service. Um, I mean, I have, you know, been very fortunate and have consciously decided to stay in a university setting that probably loses money, you know, constantly. If it weren't for the taxpayers, we'd be out of business, but mm -hmm. I'm not fee for service. Mm -hmm. So if I don't think something's going to, if I don't, I'm a surgeon, but if I don't think surgery is going to be beneficial, I don't recommend surgery because I get paid mm -hmm. the same either way. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think very many people grow up wanting to be a veterinarian for the money, but no. it, 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 but it, it is part of the equation. So I think it's something, again, these are just, we have to be a, as pet owners and I'm a pet owner, uh, as well. These are things you just have to be aware of. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm aware of it when I take my, if, my child, or if I went to a physician that's fee for service, and they're saying you need knee surgery, I'm gonna be like, okay, 
Yeah. I, got, I got all these other things going into this equation. A surgeon telling me I need surgery, a roofer telling me I need a new roof. That's a shocker. Yeah, I think I think, right. I think awareness is definitely a starting point and just to try and help followers kind of get to grips with this because been in a little emotional turmoil about it over the last few years. How do you fix a massive problem of does it really work? And that's from a therapist point of view, from a vet point of view, and from an owner point of view, because I am kind of all three. And I think awareness is really important. But also, what owners have to remember is that they are in charge of their case. And you have the most powerful thing at your fingertips, which are these questionnaire based approaches are a starting point. So a lot of people go, oh, they're time consuming. Oh, it's a real faff. Oh, you know, I think he's better. No, guys, they're there for a reason. Yes, they're not perfect. But these clinical, they're called clinical metrology instruments, and they're free of charge. And at least they're starting to try and get you to be more objective so that both you and your veterinarian aren't being swayed by subjective opinion. So that's that's a free intervention straight off the bat. Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely. Um, so the 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 CMIs. Um, they are, and so they're really validated for a very controlled environment. Mm. I, I think um, to translate them to an individual owner and patient is a great way to add to the medical record. Mm. But... Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's something that it's something that we should do. But even with them, we just need to be understand. We need to understand that to do them the way they were originally in, studied. You know, you're like you're supposed to have the same person use the same exam room, and they read a very specific question. You know, th these are the sentences I read that instructions to the owners about how to fill it yeah. out, all that kind of stuff. Versus you know, where you just, you know, where it's just downloaded and that kind of stuff. I think the upside to that is, for example, you know, a really important, you know, we talked about earlier, a really important component of patient care is that what the owner says is the history. Yeah. And the, this, that is a, a, a way to control the question. So at least you're not skipping a question. Mm -hmm. You know, you get, you get a more consistent communication back and forth between the veterinarian and the owner and then it's actually documented so a month later you maybe you actually can look back at it and say this is what we this is what you and i thought a month ago where are we today yeah so i think that that's the big uh big reason why those things are good um, one thing i do at home where I, I have owners do at home is i have them get a little box and when I think their dog's having a bad day, write the date on the box, put it in the box. I don't want it on the calendar because then they can look at the calendar all the time. Oh, that's a good one. You know, and then at the at at at, at the end of a three month period, or you know, so okay, we're going to do this treatment. We're going to try Plan A for two months. Yeah. At the end of two months, this is where we are. How many yeah. how many times? Now you now we're going to go back in the box, dump it out. He said, okay, there were five bad days out of 60. Mm. Is that good enough or not? You know, I know you said that you were a bit IT poor. <laughs> that could be a and Yeah, I yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know when you're going to go like, your 1920s. <laughs> but um, we actually went to an app developer and said, we want to do a cam app. And one of the things we wanted was a pop-up that could come up however many times a day you wanted. It could be once a day, it could be twice a day. And it was just literally good day, bad day. And you have a split second to press because let's be honest, we're all very busy, but there is almost a little bit of a gut instinct that we all have. You know, you have that deep seated feeling because as you're right, with any of those questionnaires, you can budge them. And I did with Holly. When Holly was doing a massive downturn towards the end, that by the way, that was my dog. I fudged results 
I didn't want to I didn't want to be honest with myself it was horrendous um so we have to be aware of that so yeah questionnaires are a step in the right direction but they're they're certainly not perfect good day bad day diary yeah guys you can put it on your fridge or you can cut them into tiny little squares so we have we have a diary um it's a pdf you can download from the website and it's called the good day bad day diary and you can just pin it to your fridge now guys under strict instructions from mike you're going to cut them into tiny little squares <laughs> and get them on. It's going to be well the point is i don't want them to <laughs> be influenced by the their previous reports absolutely you know, to some degree, i mean i benefit when i kind of forget about what happened before you know yeah uh, you know you kind of forgive your forgive your memory yeah no but i think this is what I love about this, and I hope that Cam followers agree, is that you're learning, like I'm learning, that science is complicated and science takes time and a lot of thought and serious, you know, methodology to try and make sure that our answer is as true as possible. So when you have somebody say to you, oh, my last three dogs, they, they did really well on that. Comparing that to a scientific investigation where you've got all these bases covered, it's a big difference. There's a big difference there. Um, something else that I wanted us to talk about. Oh, she's put good day, bad day diary up there. Where is it? Where is it? It was the last one. Da -da -da -da. Okay, this is from Skepfet. Okay, so don't blame me for this one. What do you feel about things that have been shown to be a placebo in humans that are being extrapolated over into dogs? So he makes a statement and he's coming to join us in December that if we know a therapy in humans has been shown to be pretty placebo based, there's not a huge amount of evidence it's effective. And then it arrives in the dog world. What would you feel about that? That's a bit. Um, well, I, 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 the scientist in me tries to approach everything somewhat ambivalent. So if it's, and really the thing of it is, is there translation from dog to human and human to dog should be done, that equation should be um, treated equally. Mm -hmm. So if something worked in a dog, would you just do that? automatically or yeah. if it didn't work in a dog would you just dismiss it automatically mm -hmm. and so i think you have to kind of have an open mind um both ways mm -hmm. the the pharmacology is different the psychology is different and so uh i i, I can see you know the the skeptic sarc Fantastic part of me is like, well, it didn't work in people, so they gave it to the veterinarians. You know, so there's that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it's not a very intelligent response. You know, is unfortunately kind of the way I approach things sometimes, but, I, <laughs> <laughs> but tonight I'll try to say, well, let's let's be adults. You're doing really well. You're doing really well. I'm impressed. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I, I would have an open, open mind, and I yeah. um, mean, so there, there's actually a really good. Um, so if you're a, a pharmaceutical company, and you develop a, a drug, and well, are you going to try to make five billion dollars a year with it, or fifty million dollars a year with it? Mm -hmm. So, if, but if it doesn't work in people, that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't work in dogs. No. You know, so, in the trials. Yeah, again, gotta, again, I guess this was a bit of a misleading one, is that we know that a lot of data gets extrapolated between species, um, especially in the world of supplements. You know, the, you'll find a supplement company will refer to a paper that was produced in 1984 and it was done on 100 humans how can can we relate that to dogs we really do need to be doing more species specific large scale you know trials but it's just not there because there's a lot of yeah, money no, I mean, the, the research isn't there for most of 
most supplements. This is what, uh, um, and I, this is my career. So I, I, I can tell you that there has been many an occasion where a company has approached me and explained how this supplement works. And, um, hey, well, you start using it. And I just, I mean, I ask for the, the scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. And I say, hey, I'll tell you what. I mean, there's been some big time supplements, commercially successful supplements. You know, re you're really talking about a $400 million market in the United States for the treatment of osteoarthritis in dogs. Mm -hmm. If you have 10% of that market, well, you can't, you're not, you, there's no way I, I, I can believe that you can't put $200,000, $100,000 into a pretty solid, for $100,000, you can do a pretty solid clinical trial mm. out of the, you know, $40 million you're making. Mm. So um, if they're not willing to do that and they want to tell me how it works in a Petri dish, or how it worked 40 years ago in this one little study in people. I mean, I'm just like, hey, man, um, I, I think my patients and my owners deserve better. See, there you go. Now, I didn't set him up for that. I said you can say exactly what you want. It's an open forum. Um, and that's pretty powerful. And I, 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 I do believe I, I feel the same you know I think there's a lot of people that are spending a vast amount of money on alternatives and they can't see the wood for the trees and we did we did such an interesting post um about a year ago asking people to own up what do they spend and one of the really interesting things that came out of it is a big proportion of owners went crikey I spend more money on all the other stuff more so than I spend at the vet so when they actually added together that food that says it's got a joint supplement in it, that supplement, that pizzle stick, that this, that, the other. So trying to be kind, guys. I'm not trying to be um, – I'm, I'm not trying to upset the apple cart. Well, if you can get it on Amazon, mm, be nervous. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And – I hope anybody that's been watching Cam for a while now knows that the things that we really promote are free of charge, you know, and that has got a lot of evidence, you know, the weight control throughout life, a lot of evidence to suggest that has such an impact. And we were talking about my wish to do a PhD on the environmental impact and pain. There is a little bit of evidence-based logic in that, you know, if you're going to watch your dog fall over on a slippery floor repeatedly, that is going to do harm. That's just, it's just, but we, I'd love to get data about that. So, caregiver placebo, I think, hopefully, who has stuck through with this, because it's quite a gritty topic. And by the way, Jamie McClement thinks you're spot on there. Um, it is quite a, gr it's a gritty topic. It's not easy for everybody to hear. All of us want to live in a bubble and just believe that what we're doing is working. None of us want to be... When none of us want it to be more difficult than it is it's already really hard and I know there's a lot of owners out there that they get comfort in buying things they get comfort at doing something they believe it's doing something because they care about mm -hmm. that thing in their care and to have somebody come and go well it might not work is probably not what they want to hear so I'm really sorry guys but let's see it a different way around that money that you invest in that in intervention can be invested elsewhere that time that you spent on that intervention can be invested elsewhere with positive benefits. So don't be doom and gloom about this. So I'm not going to let you go without doing 10 top tips. <laughs> so for the guys that are, have stuck this out, 10 top tips is to try and bring everything back to balance. So the idea of them is to give people advice and it doesn't matter what you earn, how much money you got, whether your dog's insured or not, you know, it applies to everybody. So we hope that they're really helpful. Um, so I'm going to start number 10. And I just said it, weight, it's just a no-brainer. And we know there was a paper out saying that owners of overweight dogs spend between 17% and 3% more on their dog throughout their lifetime because of obviously overfeeding, but also ill health. 
So if you really want to have a massive impact on your budget, get your dog to the right weight. You could be saving yourself 50% investment. There you go. Number nine. Use a leash. Oh, oh, oh. Explain why. Well, so, I mean, I'm a surgeon. And, uh, man, we do a fracture repair on a dog that gets hit by a car almost every day. Yeah. And it costs thousands of dollars. And for every dog <laughs> that an owner pays thousands of dollars on for a fracture repair, there are probably five or 10 that sustained a fracture and the owners didn't have the resources to actually get it fixed. And that dog was left untreated or, or put to sleep, euthanized. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I just think it's the cost a dollar. And, yeah. um, and then, you know what, if you have a leash and you need to take your dog on a walk, gosh, you just might get some fresh air and some exercise along the way. Yeah. And I would um, definitely like to cite David Dykus on this one because he's, he's like, you know, get your dog on a leash and walk. You know, there's so many people out there that their idea of taking their dog for a walk, which, by the way, is great for joint health, is getting the joints moving, getting the forces going yeah. through them, the joint range of motion, getting the stability, getting the heart rate up. And they let their dog out and the dog sniffs in a hedge and then it goes back in. And they're like, it's walked. You're like, no, that's not walking. Get on a leash, walk. Love it. Yeah. At eight, for me, is going to be flooring. I just... I'm looking for funding. I'm looking for funding, anybody. Um, I really, really want to get evidence out there that flooring has a massive, massive influence on progression and pain state. And I say something that's really quite harsh. You can get used to the sight of a rug. You will not get used to losing your dog. And in my experience, I haven't got science to back this up. I see massive variation in dogs that are already debilitated by OA that then are asked to live on non-tractional flooring. Please think about rugs. They don't cost very much. Number seven. Get a second opinion. <laughs> God, they're great. Crikey. Yeah, no, so, I, I mean, there's so many reasons why you should get a second opinion. I mean, you, just got, you need to gather information. You explore your treatment options. Um, there's, it, there's a possibility that the first veterinarian missed something. Mm -hmm. um, you may have to get a third opinion. There is one piece of data out there that reports that up to 20% of people that get a second opinion leave the second opinion with a totally different diagnosis. So that's huge. Um, yeah. I, you may also find that there's differences in cost, training of the people, level of communication, risk assessment, risk benefit. Yeah. Um, you know, I have colleagues that are willing to do stuff. I'd be like, there's no freaking way I would ever offer that. <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, I do that all the time. You know, so I, I'm like, OK, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, so I, I think that. Uh, Get a second opinion, especially if there's yeah. a complication. Yeah. And I'm just going to add, because we're, we're British here and we're, we we chew for everything, we have this kind of like, oh, we, we have to behave like a British person, do as we're told. If, if you know, don't be ashamed to ask for it. You know, you are allowed. You're, you're paying for this service. It's not like you're dedicated surgery on the NHS and that's the only one that you can go to. And... Don't be scared to speak to the vet and just say, you know, is there somebody else in the practice? You know, we're all human. And I know that as a first opinion practitioner, quite often I would like my colleague to come and give their opinion as well. I'm, I'm not scared of it. So don't be shy about that. Number six in the same vein is, guys, you are in charge of your dog. So start taking some power of observation. It is so difficult when an owner comes in and says, I think he's better. And you're like, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> why? What are you seeing? Tell me what you see to make you believe your dog is better. Because yeah. if you're not seeing improvement, we can change it, you know, but go with 
entity. And that's where we've got all of these resources for you guys to use. We've got the client specific outcome measures. We've got the good day, bad day diary. And um, we've got the OA booklet and we can do links to load, CBP, Helsinki, what you like. You know, use it, go with stuff to try and make that decision better. Number five. Hey, back, back to yours, number six. Um, and go with a video of a good day and a bad day. Uh, it's made my life so much easier. I mean, people yeah. are like, hey, show me a good day. Show me a bad yeah. day. And then I'm like, oh, that's what that's what you're talking about. Um, don't feed raw diets to your dogs. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. What? Can I just vacate? <laughs> is this a big deal? So, I mean, your dog is not a wolf. I mean, it has been freaking thousands of years. Genetically, they're different. In fact, I mean, so one, we, we, they're genetically different. Um, two, we actually know that their gastrointestinal systems have evolved and um, actually need starches. So that's something that they need in their diet. In addition, raw diets are dangerous to the dog, but they are dangerous to your family. I mean, there is bacteria, crazy amounts, and it's a public health risk. And then finally, there's actually pretty strong data linking um, grain-free diets to dilated cardiomyopathy. So it just doesn't make any sense to me. The only reason I'm laughing is it is the thing that I am terrified, probably more than supplement conversation, is the raw diet debate. And we actually, everybody can witness me say it, we we, ver we try and get around it because it's such a passionate topic. Jeez. And I don't want our mission, which is pain management, OA management, to yeah. be circumvented by getting caught into a, a hugely emotive area. So, I apologize for that. <laughs> no, you go for it. I told you, you could have free reign. You're allowed to say whatever you like. But I'm, I'm just giggling inside. Dawn, who's one of the team, is going to be wetting herself right at this moment. Right, number four. I'm going to go back to bringing back to baseline. This is a little, little pet hate of mine, and people have heard me say it before. Car journeys. Now, I've got a bit of a bad back at the moment. And I've noticed being in the car when someone else is driving, it's a bit, oh God, because you don't see corners coming. You can't brace yourself. Now, just imagine if you were pretty sore, your joints are sore, your back's sore, you've got myofascial pain, and you're in the boot of a car, no bedding, no support, and you've got a long journey ahead, or you're always, every day, twice a day to the park is in the back of the car. Think about that as being another area that you need to provide good bedding, bolster, make sure it's comfortable, and don't let them jump in and out. Please help them. My turn. Adopt a pet. Ooh. So, you know, one, you save a life. And I, I don't have any personal issues um, with breeders or uh, uh, or purebred dogs. But, but factually, um, when it comes to orthopedics, when it comes to orthopedic diseases, there is an undeniable link between genetics and the probability of getting a, an orthopedic disease, mm. which almost all lead to arthritis, osteoarthritis. Mm. And there is, it is, hybrid vigor is real when it comes to decreasing the frequency of osteoarthritis. Mm. Now, if you really want to, so we'll set hybrid of vigor to the side. So mm. that's great. But even if you want a purebred dog, there are all sorts of purebred dogs that you can adopt as opposed to spending a thousand pounds on one. Mm. So and if anybody, just something yeah. that, yeah. I mean, I'm if, super proud of my youngest daughter who just came home for a holiday from university and on her way home called and said, by the way, I'm bringing home a dog I adopted from the Humane Society. I love Yeah, how do you say, oh, I can't believe you did that? 
<laughs> you think I about what that. I do for a living and I preach to her, you're like, okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Vets do accumulate animals, don't they? Um, just got to big up another online platform that is pretty stupendous talking about signalment. Um, vetlessons.co.uk. No, vetlessons.com. Mike Farrell has done a wicked website where you can actually look at the the likelihood of a four-limb lameness in, say, a pug or in a German Shepherd or in a Labrador. Because let's be honest, common is common. And there are definitely um, genetic, you know, um, influences. So yeah. go to that website. I'll put a link because it's awesome. Um, my number two, and we'll, we will answer your questions, guys. Um, number two for me is really important. As a vet, telling an owner that their dog is uncomfortable, potentially in pain, long-term disease, they might have missed it, is actually really difficult. So you imagine this in my small box room, I've got my you know, computer screen, got the owner coming in, they're coming for vaccine, and I've got to break it to them that their dog actually has got significant um, arthritic change in multiple joints. He's pretty damn debilitated. He's been in pain for quite a while. We don't need to do this because if all of us were much more observant and able to communicate with each other, Mabel at the poo bin, who has great influence, could have said, Hey, Marjorie, your dog's slowing down a bit. Have you thought that he might have arthritis? You could pop in and see your vet. Um, see what I mean? So, we as a collective, influence this disease and it doesn't just have to be a veterinarian it can be somebody else that you spend time with saying those signs that you thought were normal they're not get it checked out number one for you buyer beware on nutraceuticals so i mean it uh glucosamine chondroitin green lipped mussels omega-3 fatty acids if you can buy it off the shelf or on the internet the more you pay does not mean the more effective it is. If they say it needs, you need to do this for three months and then you'll decide really what they're doing is they're trying to get you to form a habit, a habit of buying a product from them, not necessarily trying to get the, they're not worried about your, your, your pet. They're worried about making money. So uh, be super, super cautious, be super diligent vigilant about finding whether it works all you have to do it, you do look at what's called a systematic review or meta-analysis or go to the Cochrane library which mm -hmm. is british um you know and on their internet on the websites if you find something that is reverses or stops arthritis I mean, look for the citation where they received a Nobel Prize. Mm. Because really, there's nothing that change, that modifies that disease. No. You know, there's just nothing that has scientifically proven, no surgery, no pill, that, that, that stops it or slows it. No. So that no. should be a major red flag for you. Yeah, definitely. And... Um... Stephen Fox does uh, quite a good kind of um, acclaim. So you can try and start a bit more savvy. What I'll try and do is remember to put a link to that as well. Because it is a minefield. And we just come across as party poopers all the time. And by by saying this, because you're like, I want something to have influence. Yeah. And unfortunately, there isn't. What? No, there is. Weight control, exercise, preventing further injury, early diagnosis. Yeah, that has a massive influence. Purchasing, purchasing, purchasing doesn't. Well, and you can, like I mentioned, omega-3 fatty acids, the uh, overwhelming science that they can change, that they can, the patient can benefit from omega-3 fatty acids in the right formulation. And there are prescription diets that have pretty strong um, scientific evidence of efficacy. Mm -hmm. You just can't go to the grocery store and buy it off the shelf no no and i get a little bit scared when people are buying bags of treats that are like five pounds for 30 treats and they've got joint benefit you're like really they probably have a mate <laughs> yeah um so are you okay if we just do a couple of questions before we head off 
Let's do There's it. no hate mail yet. There's no hate no, mail. No, no, that's all right. Take number. Um, what are any thoughts on long term prescription meds? But she meant to say on long term diet prescription food. So that's what. What do you think oh, about oh, prescription oh, diets? Oh, oh. Well, uh, so disclaimer I'm not a um, nutritionist um, expert, mm -hmm. but. I guess I would have to think about what's long term. A definition of long term in the scientific literature, anyway, might be a year. So, um, I, if they're on a prescription weight loss diet, I don't, I'm not aware of any intermediate term length that would cause a problem. Mm. Three to six months, for example. Mm. If your dog's been on a weight loss diet, prescription diet for that period of time and has not lost any weight, um, I, you know, so th then you have to kind of question well, what's going on here. Um, the reality of it is, is we don't have a whole lot of dogs starving to death. No. So, um, but I don't want to um to discredit the the potential problem that there may be um so it may not be nutritional in at all levels for a healthy dog so but, like the, the weight loss ones you know, yeah the weight loss one but I, I gosh i i'm not aware again i'm not an expert but i'm not aware of an adverse effect any publications addressing an adverse no. effect of that be, them being on a prescription weight loss diet for a long term no no normally they have quite a lot of data to show how you from weight loss into maintenance and but like with everything you know it's a regular checkup at your vet regular weigh-ins make sure that you're actually you know being observant and you know pet care is about being observant and you guys are the, the, the leaders of this. You know, you're with your dog all the time. You're the ones that are going to be coming in and bringing this to our attention to help you. Um, just so you know, talking about nutritionists, we've got the um, Cecilia Villaverde coming in January and she's a European diploma um, holder in um, nutrition and she has no vested interest. She's not working for any company. She is a standalone entity, very hard to find. So she'll be here in January. Um, and with our talk about trying to get like systematic reviews and, you know, meta-analysis, we will be launching our new website next spring. And what we hope is we will be able to expand all your supplement stuff, guys, so we can put papers for you to read that we found are most relevant. And we'll try. To so, again, we're never going to sell any of this stuff. We just want to try and get you as much fact as possible. Um, this one's quite an interest Are you saying vets aren't influenced by marketing? Doesn't seem a sensible conclusion, even though they are probably more influenced by data and reports and studies. I can't imagine marketing doesn't does influence. Yeah, so I'd say if, vets are. If if I said that, I um, that is not the message I meant to portray. I am almost quite the opposite. I do think veterinarians can be influenced by marketing. I what concerns me actually is when veterinarians get into the business of marketing to their clients, mm. um, kind of overstating how successful a medication or surgery might be. Mm. Um, and so I think that yeah, I mean that they're sounds horrible, but I I. I I think they, they can be um, part of the marketing machine to some degree and, the thing they, is, so, and, and influenced by it. Yeah, I am. Um, it was about a year ago. I walked into the airport and saw all of the advertising screens to change the videos. And I'd been told that there's going to come a point where wherever you walk, your iPhone, your mobile phone will set up um, so that the marketing will be very relevant to you. A bit like what we experience now mm -hmm. on if you're interested in a blind for your house, suddenly you get blinds, blinds. 
So marketing is actually everywhere. We can't avoid it. It is just there. Yeah. Something really cute. Um, James Herriot's back on YouTube. All creatures great and small. And when you look at the pharmacy of only what's that? Fifty years ago, um, sixty years ago. There's no labels. You know, there's just the the, the tinctures, the pills, the the glass jars with just what is in it. You know, and you think how much we've changed. Everything has changed now. You know, anyway, that's kind of on a little journey. <laughs> now, this one's Can't really wrong. interesting. I love, can't get around it. I love this, um, the nocebo effect. Well, let, let's just end on this one because it's quite, quite fascinating. Can you tell people what the yeah. nocebo effect is? Well, nocebo effect is actually the opposite of the placebo effect. So, um, you know, where the placebo effect is where they're, they benefit from the process of being, taking a, 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 a pill of air. They, uh, some people might be harmed. Some mm. people, you know, they're, it worsens. Um, so when it comes to a caregiver nocebo effect, yes, I do think that that's possible. Um, and I think that there, we all have our, you know, our biases and, um, you know, some, some people are super optimistic. And so maybe they're going to think, Oh, my dog's doing great. And you know, other people are super negative. They're like, my dog's doing horrible. You know, mm -hmm. so is that possible? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there are times, so we do, uh, you know, I try to collect as much objective data as possible on, on patients and we, you know, whether it's with gait analysis, with activity monitors, we're doing some really good stuff. We're trying to come up with an open source activity monitor that actually can be used for regulatory studies. Um, but so I can say, here's where we were a month ago. You know, this is how much weight Fido's putting on that operated leg a month ago. Here it is today. Yeah. Now, yeah. I know at home you said you're not seeing any improvement, but here we're seeing a 15% improvement. Mm. So I don't know. I, I, you know, it's difficult for me to tell why there's a discrepancy, you know, in what you're seeing at home. I believe what you're seeing at home. And this is where I'll go to take a video of a bad day. Yeah. And let I me think see this is a home. I think a really good endpoint for tonight is to just say a few things that are pretty much free of charge that an owner can do to be more objective. So you've said video. Um, Lynn, would you be lovely in our little how to do a video for your dog up so people can see what they're supposed to do? It's not follow it around from that angle. That does not help us. Yeah. Um, we've got um, the activity monitors. Over here in the UK, we've got Pit Pack which we have just going to start having in the shop. So it's not validated, but it gives you an overall impression. Muscle mass measurements, we've got goniometry, we've got CMI. All of those actually are pretty free of charge and an owner can do all of them. Look at that, guys. Five, Five things. So what I'll do is I'll put a list down. If the people that want to be more objective and want to be able to go with more data so that they can get more accurate answers, we'll put that list down there for you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for having me. No, I've loved it. I've loved it. I love Good. the fact that you took all the attention. <laughs> Just opinions. It's good. It's good. And this is what the platform's about. It's trying to get opinions out there. So thanks, Mike. I'm so grateful. Until then, guys, please say thank you. And we'll see you next time. Have a good evening.